unless we give people a sense that their values, uh, that their voice is being respected and represented in the institutions, then what we've seen across the West over the last 20, 30 years, and I've been studying you know, politics for a long time, what we see in Britain and France with Marine Le Pen or Italy with Giorgio Maloney or the Sweden Democrats or Donald Trump or Vox in Spain or Chega in Portugal, Viktor Orban in Hungary, law and justice in Poland. What, we, what we've seen over the last 20 years, I think is just going to accelerate as this new elite shows itself unable to really compromise with many voters in their own countries and deliver the changes these people want to see. Matthew Goodwin is Professor of Politics at the University of Kent. I think he's a fantastic thinker. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Uh, can I say at the outset, he's the author of multiple books on populism. His latest book is Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics. Matthew, welcome. It's terrific to have you. Uh, and let's start with an overview of your, uh, your most recent book, uh, you effectively argue that Britain's undergone a revolution. That which was on top is now at the bottom. That which was on the bottom is now at the top. Uh, you talk about populism, Nigel Farage, people didn't see it coming. Then Johnson and the Red Wall. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Brexit in the middle, then Johnson and the Red Wall. Extraordinary times. Can you tell us uh, a little about the book and what you're driving at? Yeah, thanks, John. I think for anybody who's I've uh, been watching British politics closely or from a distance will know that we've had these three big revolts in our country over the last uh, 13 years or so. We, we've had the rise of Nigel Farage, who is obviously similar to other politicians in Europe, who's tapped into a sense of frustration among millions of voters with the political consensus. We've had the vote for Brexit, which shocked much of the same establishment. And then we had the rise of Boris Johnson, uh, and the realignment, John, of our politics, which obviously lots of Australians uh, and Americans will, will recognise. We had lots of working class voters, lots of voters who haven't passed through university, lots of older voters moving to the Conservatives, lots of graduates, lots of younger voters, lots of social liberals moving to the left and the Labour Party. And so really what I'm trying to do with this book is explain what on earth is going on. And, and the answer in short is that all of these events really reflect a growing rebellion among voters, uh, a growing sen sense of frustration at a new elite in British society, an elite that is very different from the old elite, and I'm sure we'll get into what those differences are, but a new elite that is essentially imposing uh, its values on the rest of the country, is denying many people a voice in the national conversation, uh, and is losing touch, John, with uh, many voters in wider society. So my argument is, unless we really look at the people who are dominating the institutions in not just Britain, but Western democracies, and unless we reform those institutions and give people more of a stake in the direction of their societies, especially on these big cultural issues like immigration and identity and belonging, then we're going to see a lot more rebellions in the years to come. Can I pick up, um, you mentioned the three events, uh, Nigel Farage, uh, populism, people didn't see that coming, uh, uh, and then um, a Brexit itself, uh, a rebellion, as you say, against elites, uh, and then then Johnson and the Red Wall. Um, I guess a lot of people would have thought, well, surely things will settle now, but there's been something of a revolution, uh, and uh, Boris Johnson's become the Prime Minister. He's rewritten politics in a lot of ways. That's what the Red Wall was about. Um but it didn't happen. People assumed he'd bed down Brexit. He was an author of it. He was a driver of it. He, he passionately argued for it. And I guess people thought, well, he'll now make it work. And that's not what happened. To what extent would you say the Prime Minister Johnson was, he's, if you like, himself was the problem? And to what extent would you say it was, for what Frank Ferruti might call, the expertocracy, the new elites, determined to frustrate it, that led really effectively to failure. It hasn't, but it didn't work. Yeah, I think there are two things that essentially were going on. The first is that in the aftermath of Boris Johnson's victory in 2019, uh, the Conservative Party, 
didn't really understand the extent to which the country's politics were being realigned. Uh, the party uh, was given this unique electorate, this unique coalition of working class, non-graduate, older voters, cultural conservative voters. They wanted less immigration. They wanted regions outside of London invested in. They were skeptical of what I call hyper-globalization. They were skeptical of the constant prioritization of big business over national interests. Uh, and they were very anxious about the rise of radical woke progressivism, uh, the erosion of free speech, the rise of cancel culture, uh, the erosion of boundaries between uh, men and women and, and the constant rewriting of our national history. Now, the conservatives could have leaned into that realignment, John. They could have reshaped their electorate for the long term, which is what I actually suggested to Boris Johnson on two occasions when I presented uh, my research to, to people in and around number 10 that, that, that they should do, that conservatism needed to reinvent itself. It needed to stay committed to this new electorate. What happened, however, is they didn't do that. And they didn't do that partly because Boris Johnson was always a bohemian. He was a cosmopolitan. He was essentially a liberal. He wasn't really a conservative. And you can see that in the policy decisions he took. He liberalized immigration from outside of Europe. Uh, he even, John, removed a requirement for British companies to advertise British jobs in Britain first. Uh, this was not somebody who understood the general direction of travel out there in the country. So that was one part of the story about how the Conservatives lost touch with this electorate. The other part, as you say, really was the way in which many of the people who dominate the institutions in this country, and I'm not just talking about politics, I'm talking about media, creative industries, cultural institutions, universities, schools, the people who determine the shape of our national conversation, who determine what is acceptable to discuss and what is not, who determine what issues dominate the conversation. You know, they had very little interest in changing the broken status quo. They didn't want to challenge globalization. They didn't want to challenge mass immigration. They didn't want to give more of a voice to the rest of the country. We saw this time and time again in how they tried to essentially dilute Brexit to the point of it being meaningless, how they didn't reform the institutions and let other uh, voices into those institutions. We also partly saw it during COVID, where anybody who voiced a dissenting view was was stigmatized and silenced as being a crank or a, a lunatic. And, and this is really the second part of, of the story. And, and what I'm saying in this book, John, is unless we give people a sense that their values, uh, that their voice is being respected and represented in the institutions, then what we've seen across the West over the last 20, 30 years, and I've been studying you know, politics for a long time, what we see in Britain and France with Marine Le Pen or Italy with Georgia Maloney or the Sweden Democrats or Donald Trump or Vox in Spain, or Chega in Portugal, Viktor Orban in Hungary, law and justice in Poland. What, we, what we've what we seen over the last 20 years, I think is just going to accelerate as this new elite shows itself unable to really compromise with many voters in their own countries and deliver the changes these people want to see. It seems to me that there were plenty of warnings. There were plenty of people unpacking what had happened. David Goodhart's idea of the anyways and the somewheres uh, the elites believing they knew better than the ordinary people in the street. It seems to me that what the elites have done, we'll come to who the elites are because people roll their eyes when you talk about elites in a moment, but what they've actually done, let's assume we, we know, you'd know an elite if you fell over one, so to speak, um, they've hardened down in their position, that the, the plebs, if you like, the ordinary people, the deplorables, really are deplorable and shouldn't be listened to, rather than having the humility to say, uh, well, actually, it is a democracy and they do have a say and they should be respected for it. Do you I, I think suspect, I, as I watch it as a former political figure, that, that in many ways they're making the absolute worst mistake. They're hardening in their position against ordinary people. And I think the evidence shows that quite clearly, John. Look, if you look at what's happened since the rise of Donald Trump and the vote for Brexit, those two seismic moments in 2016, what we see very clearly in the evidence, the Americans would refer to it as the great awakening. Um, I would refer to it as the elites and the masses drifting further apart. Uh, the evidence is clear. Many of the people who dominate the institutions 
um, who are often, you know, elite graduates who are not just socially liberal, but have embraced radical uh, woke progressivism. Uh, they've been drifting sharply to the cultural left on questions to do with culture, identity, and belonging. Uh, this is an empirical fact. We can see it very clearly in the data. And as they move left, as they've embraced things like, you know, support for immigration, um, believing that rights for minorities haven't gone uh, far enough, uh, believing that we cannot move on as a society unless we revisit what they see as historic injustices that happened 200 or 300 years ago, uh, in their views of wanting to prioritize social justice over things like free speech, um, that they've been moving further away from the average voter. And we see this in politics too. In Britain, um, both Conservative and Labour MPs are closer together on these cultural issues uh, than they are um, close to the average voter. They've, they've, they've moved sharply to the cultural left. And so that's really exacerbated the problems in Western societies because many voters rightly are now looking at the corridors of power and they're not really seeing leaders who are reflecting their views on issues um, to do with sex and gender, to do with uh, migration and borders, uh, to do with um, our relationship with supranational institutions like the European Union, uh, to do with how we think about our history and our culture. And so um, the only way I think we can really move forward constructively is by uh, trying to close this void uh, between voters uh, and and rulers. And as you say, John, so far we've seen very little evidence that, that they're willing to do that. And unless they do, as we've discovered, and we're still discovering around much of Europe at the moment, unless they do meet voters on these existential questions like solving the illegal migration crisis, which is engulfing Italy as we speak uh, today in, in September 2023, unless they meet voters' concerns over Islamist terrorism, over uh, the rise of, of a, an anti-Western woke uh, worldview, uh, then they will, they will come under growing political pressure from new insurgents, from new parties, from new social movements. So I, I don't think this is beyond dispute. When my book came out, many people in the new elite were very critical. Uh, they hadn't had the mirror held up to them in this way, but their reaction spoke volumes because the reaction was very dismissive. It was very derogatory. It was very, uh, it was very uh, elitist. Um, and for another half of the country, the book connected very strongly because they live their lives watching uh, the this new elite and having to live with the consequences of their decisions, of their luxury beliefs, of their embrace of things that they're never going to feel the direct con consequences of, like mass migration, like the erosion of, of family, uh, like the like the uh, rise of uh, gender identity theory, and so on. So I I, I think you're right. They have doubled down. Um, they've entrenched uh, their power. They still dominate the institutions, and that is why I am absolutely convinced we will have more political turbulence in the years ahead. I must say, I, it, it concerns me enormously. I think you're right. And it concerns me even in this country. When you look at the collapse in the primary vote of the major political parties, in a sense, it tells you it's sort of the same breaking of trust in, in of confidence in um, the traditional parties to, uh, if you like, represent the people that they used to represent. Um, it does strike me that you made a very interesting comment a moment ago, the Conservatives failed to, um, if you like, find a new Conservatism, a new approach and lean into the opportunities they had after the so-called Red War, all the large reversal of politics, of course, where much of the country in Britain, that, and we see this in America and Australia, this sort of re massive realignment. So people, electorates who would never have voted Labor swept Johnson to power, they failed to lean into it. Isn't part of the problem, though, that I think you've just alluded to it, really, um, no one knows what the great political philosophies are anymore. So conservatives don't know what conservatism is. Well, exactly. If you look, for example, at, at Westminster and Australians and Americans might recognise this point. Um, the first thing to say is over 90% of our MPs now belong to the graduate class and half of them pass through the elite institutions. Uh, so Oxbridge or a Russell Group University. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but in politics we used to have a much 
greater diversity of, of viewpoints in the institutions. So that's gone. The largest single tribe of politicians in Westminster are what we might call political careerists, people who have only ever spent their lives in politics. Um, the trade unionist, the working class politician, the, the person with you know what we might call relatively ordinary life experience is gone. And that's also true in the media, by the way, where local and regional media have broken down. So now much of our media class goes straight from uh, you know, a degree in journalism at Oxbridge into the newsrooms and, and, and don't really have much experience outside of that. So, so I think within all of that, their understanding of political philosophy has broken down. Most MPs in Britain are not very knowledgeable when it comes to politics and political theory. I think the Conservatives have a specific problem, John, in Britain, in that they are absolutely still consumed by Thatcherism and the 1980s, which in my mind was only ever a blip in the long Conservative tradition that we have in this country. But I think there is a big part of the Conservative Parliamentary Party and the donor class uh, that surrounds the party, which still thinks 1988 is the answer to today's problems. And as we discovered with the Liz Trust Premiership, that is not the case. Um, the most successful conservatives around the world are the conservatives who have understood that the foundations of politics have increasingly moved away from debates about economic freedom to debates about cultural freedom. And the conservatives who have embraced that and understood that uh, have been the conservatives that have broken through with new electorates. And unfortunately in Britain, the Tories, you know, there are two things going on. One is they instinctively look to Margaret Thatcher for the answers. And, you know, she had a lot of compelling answers, but they were answers to a different set of questions. Um, and, and they haven't moved on intellectually. There are, there are no serious intellectual heavyweights in the conservative movement today in Britain. You know, if you looked at who was around Boris Johnson, there was nobody of substance if you looked at who was around previous prime ministers, you know there there were people who had a grasp of of history, of 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 theory, of uh, you know uh, of, of of intellectual substance, let's say, and, and that has not been the case. But the second thing is the British Tories are notoriously status driven. You know they view these cultural questions as being beneath them. They don't want to get into a debate about legal migration. They don't want to get into a debate about birth rates and the future demographic crisis. They don't want to discuss gender identity theory and how we're indoctrinating children in ideas that have no basis in science. They view these cultural questions um, as beneath them, as ones they don't want to get into. And the fact that we've allowed history, identity, the rights of women, the rights of children to be defined as cultural questions itself reflects the weakness of contemporary conservatism. You know, they have essentially allowed a large swathe of their own territory to be redefined as something that is seen to be toxic and socially unacceptable to discuss. So I I agree with your point. There is a lack of intellectual rigor uh, among today's conservatives, but there is also a general lack of courage. Uh, and, and I look at a generation of conservatives who, to be honest, are very weak and, and, and often quite cowardly in how they approach these big political battles of our time. But Chile's a great irony in that. You make the point that there's a lack of intellectual rigor on the part of conservatives, but it's not as if they're really confronted by elites who are rigorous in their intellectualism. I would have thought, uh, firstly, they are uh, incredibly given to emotionalism. That shows in the way that they patronize their fellow human beings They've not learnt themselves the lessons of history, which is, are that you know, if you break democracy, you'll end up in an ugly place in a totalitarian regime where the first people at risk probably are the intellectuals. So you've almost got high emotionalism versus high emotionalism going on here, rather than clear thinking, at a time when, quite frankly, the West is in grave danger. We're 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 totally incoherent now as societies. So. How are we ever going to progress? Well, firstly, let me test the thesis. Is this high emotion versus high emotion? Because it seems to me you talk of intellectual rigor. It's, it's not coming out of academia and spilling into all of these other cultural movements that you're talking about. They're intellectually very flimsy and, and they're pushed with enormous vigor. But the, 
central feature of that vigor to me seems to be this patronizing idea that if you dare to disagree, you're a deplorable. Oh, I think there's a lot of a lot of truth to that. I think if you take the universities, for example, where where I work, um, they're a good example of how the institutions have been steadily politicized and have become more interested in pushing an ideological agenda than doing what they're supposed to do, which is searching for truth and exposing students to a diverse range of ideas. And to give you one stat from the book, in the 1960s, uh, for every one conservative in the universities, there were three uh, there were three academics on the left. Uh, today, for every one conservative, there are nine uh, academics on the left. So, you know, the ratio is not not too far off 10 to 1. And and we can look at the civil service, we can look at the public sector institutions, we can look at the media, as I say. And I think what might otherwise have been a testing ground for ideas, for serious discussion, is no longer that. You can see that in much of our political debate here in Britain. Um, you know, we, we do not have long-form substantive discussions on mainstream television about politics. Uh, one of the most interesting and revealing statistics is that ever since the vote for Brexit, one of our flagship radio programs, Radio 4, uh, today, which much of Westminster used to wake up in the morning and listen to, has lost 2 million listeners since the Brexit referendum. Public trust in established media has declined. Public confidence in the universities uh, has declined sharply. In the US, it's never been uh, as low. Um, public cynicism is up sharply. Uh, the number of voters who now say on the big issues of the day, like uh, the economy uh, or immigration, uh, that none of the parties have the answers to these problems uh, has been steadily rising. Uh, and, and often it's majorities who hold that view. So I'm, I, I think many voters are looking at the political class today and are not just disagreeing with what they're saying. I think they just simply no longer have confidence in the capacity of our leaders to answer the longer term challenges facing the country, whether that's low economic growth, whether it's a lack of productivity, whether it's defending the national interest, whether it's strengthening borders. I mean, if you look, John, at the UK from Australia, you know, the flagship promise of the Brexit revolt, which many Australians and Americans and others around the world will remember, was take back control take back control, three words that defined that grassroots rebellion. And here we are approaching 2024 and voters are looking at a country that cannot control inflation, that cannot control the illegal migration crisis on the channel, that seemingly cannot control the constant spread and creeping influence of radical woke progressivism in the institutions, which cannot seem to control legal migration, which cannot seem to deal with crime. Uh, and I, I'm a pollster, John. I mean, I spend a lot of my time polling voters, sitting in focus groups with voters, and the apathy, the sense of apathy and disillusionment is 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 palpable. So I'm deeply concerned about where we are. My hope with the events of the last decade was this, you know, they would have forced the political class to, to move closer to the people and to begin to think about um, uh, addressing some of these weaknesses, but unfortunately, they've moved in the opposite direction and, and essentially uh, denigrated and dismissed much of the rest of the country, and that's a very unfortunate thing to see indeed. The um, it seems to me that it could be said that the elites don't believe in Britain. In my case, they don't believe in Australia and America. They don't believe in America. They don't believe in the West. But my more pointed uh, issue here is they don't believe in Britain, uh, whereas many Britons want to believe in Britain. It raises the question, doesn't it, of nationalism? And is there a place for a sound uh, uh, nationalism or is it always a dirty word? Because they, you know, one group would have you believe it's a dirty word uh, and, and, and only racists and narrow-minded bigots and people who are locked in the past and have never explored the world could believe in Britain, strike Australia, strike America, whatever, um, whereas people who live in those places often have a deep attachment to country and can see that it can be valuable. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I've just been revisiting uh, some of the work of Daniel Bell, a uh, very prominent American academic who who wrote a number of great books in the post-war period, and, and one of those was was the cultural contradictions of capitalism capitalism in the early 1970s. 
And and what Bell pointed out even then was the rise of what he called a new adversary class, uh, essentially a, a, the way in which the elite were changing. And he noticed that they were deriving their status increasingly not by being proud members of the national community, but but essentially by disparaging and denigrating the national community in order to win status and esteem and honor from other members of the elite. And this really was the foundation of much of the work that followed. Think about the work of Christopher Lash in the US in the early 1990s. Think about the work of David Goodhart, his discussion of anywheres and somewheres. Think about David Brooks, his discussion of the bourgeoisie bohemians. And I think what's happened today you know, lots of people ask me, what's the difference between the new elite and the old elite? Well, one of the key differences, I think, is that the old elite in Britain, the old money Tory elite, were always disconnected from the rest of the country. They were economically disconnected. Um, they were insular. I mean, there was a, an old boys club. Henry Fairley, the journalist, first term, uh, used the term the establishment in 1955. Um, but when it came to culture, when it came to the nation, when it came to institutions, um, they respected them and they supported them. Uh, and that included the old left, by the way. It included the Clement Attlees. It included the Peter Shaws. It included the Tony Benz. You know, the old left socialists were, were we, we would go back now and read their speeches and, and consider them to be nationalist in the way that they talked about empire, in the way that they talked about the need for Britain to avoid integration with Europe, the defense of a thousand years of history and of uh, a long uh, tradition of continuity in our democracy. Um, what, what's happened today, however, is whereas the old elite derive their status more for money and property and titles, the new elite increasingly derive their status by embracing radical progressivism, by uh, critiquing, um, dismissing, undermining, uh, laughing at the nation, at identity, at history, at culture. And they're simultaneously doing that while repackaging Britishness and Englishness around these notions of um, diversity, of the universal liberalism, of multiculturalism. So they're redefining the national project around an international theme, which chimes with their values, um, at the same time denigrating that national community, which is leaving many people who do view that as a critical source of, of status and esteem feeling uh, as though they're not being taken uh, seriously at all. And I think if you look at the new elite in Britain, America, and elsewhere, I think, you know, I talk about this in the book, but what we're seeing is the rise of what some academics have called asymmetrical multiculturalism, whereby in the world of the new elite, you can celebrate every identity, every history, every culture around the world, so long as it is not your own. Uh, and when it comes to Britishness and Englishness, you must be instinctively skeptical. You must be, in some cases, openly hostile, and you must repackage those national identities around these universal themes. And many voters find this incredibly difficult to digest and deal with because, John, to say that a country is welcoming of diversity is fine, but that cannot be the basis of an entire national identity because it's like saying you don't have an identity of your own. And for many Brits and Australians and Americans, you know, they they are fiercely proud of their distinctive identity, their distinctive history, their distinctive culture, their distinctive ways of life. And they feel that those things are being rapidly eroded by globalization and by a distant elite, which is why these, po these populist politicians and others are still as strong as they've ever been, because they are tapping into this growing sense of frustration with this new ruling class. So the old elites, which uh, you know might be seen as Britain's Achilles' heel by many, its class system uh, is perhaps kinder than the new elite. Do you think? I'm not. I'm not sure. I would say it was kinder. I mean, obviously, if you go went back to the 1950s and 60s, you know, I mean, the reality is social mobility was very low. Lots of people in British society at the time didn't have rights. Lots of women, minorities, and so on, were not equal members of, of society at that time. But there was a consensus, a cultural consensus, if you like, that people were part of a national community, and that sense of belonging was critical to holding the social fabric together. And I think what we can see today, increasingly, is um, 
a ruling class, an elite that no longer really shares that consensus with voters and is not really interested in upholding uh, that that consensus. And we can see this most clearly with the issue of of migration and 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 how um, people in Westminster have responded to that question since Brexit, because the reason we voted to leave was not just about becoming an independent sovereign nation state. It was about wanting to lower migration and slow the pace of change so that we can preserve the national community that uh, we all belong to. And and what has happened in Westminster since then is the very opposite. Uh, the new elite put the pedal down on both legal and illegal migration, uh, have refused to uh, entertain any radical solutions that would uh, meet voters in the middle on those questions uh, and have exposed the country to a pace of change and churn that makes the pre-Brexit era look relatively tame by comparison. Uh, and this is why uh, the politics of migration are now back with a vengeance, uh, because many voters really do feel strongly betrayed on that question. It's why I keep talking about it in our public debate, John, because I feel also a sense of responsibility to the large majority of voters out there who who really thought they were going to get a different political settlement over the last seven years and were just given more of the same on steroids. Uh, and this is not a healthy place for any democracy uh, to be. The mystery to me, and I don't say this lightly, the mystery to me is that highly intelligent, highly educated people can't see this. And how have the universities because they're pretty proud places, most of them. They defend their role in modern society. They insist that they be publicly funded. They insist that they can provide the answers to, uh, in a complex world. And yet, more often than not, they seem to be compounding the problems. That's what we're talking about here. Academia is leading the way on some of these absurd ideas that are so roundly rejected. Uh, why is academia, in your view, why have the universities so badly lost the plot, so badly lost the capacity to understand how to move a society in a positive direction? I think the universities are in deep crisis. I've worked in the universities since 2002, I, and I've worked in universities in different countries, in both elite and non-elite universities, um, the higher education model has completely broken down. Uh, in Britain, the universities have become deeply politicized um, as they've moved sharply to the left, as the number of administrators and bureaucrats has grown. Um, and I think as um, a very militant activist minority has not been confronted. Um, and so one of the things that I've been working on with other academics here in Britain has been a a piece of legislation, the Higher Education Free Speech Act, which is the first piece of legislation in the Western world to actively uh, promote and protect academic freedom, the freedom of academics to say what they think without fear of consequence, uh, to defend academics from harassment and persecution from other academics on campus. Now, why on earth did we need that piece of legislation? because many non-conformist, gender-critical scholars, uh, pro-Brexit scholars, conservative scholars, historians who might not agree that, that Britain's empire was 100% negative and made no contribution to the world whatsoever, um, those people have been harassed and stigmatized on campus. We have a quarter of all university students in Britain who now say they self-censor in universities and lectures because they are scared of saying what they really think. We've had prominent academics like Kathleen Stock essentially chased out of their jobs by militant, radical, progressive academics, administrators, vice chancellors. And so I think universities have essentially given up on the idea that, on the founding idea that they're here to search for truth, that they're here to expose students to a wide range of ideas. And I do think they've morphed into highly political uh, projects. Of course, they started as being very religious institutions, but but in particular since the 1980s, they've, they've gradually become very openly political to the point, and I'll give you an example, John, where as an academic, I can no longer apply for a research grant and I can no longer apply for a 
for an academic job unless I submit what is called a diversity statement, unless I pledge my allegiance to diversity, equity, and inclusion, unless I explain all of the ways in which my teaching and research supports uh, DEI. Now, whatever your views of, about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I, I tend to be more, more skeptical than most, um, in, universities should not be subjecting academics and students to ideological litmus tests to determine who should and who should not be working in them. That is not the job of a university. But I don't hear many academics at all speaking out about that because obviously they're entirely comfortable with many of those things happening because it reflects their their ideological worldview. So just to be clear, I don't think there is any conspiracy going on here. All I what I think is that as these institutions have been filled with with often very privileged members of the graduate class. And as those people have drifted left in recent years, they've taken the institutions with them. And in the case of the universities, they've undermined their very purpose. I can't uh, help but wonder how long it'll be before people realize that this constant talk about inclusion, equity, and, uh, and, and diversity is just simply producing more fractured societies than ever uh, because they are if you like, so highly misleading. Diversity tends, means you know you won't have a variety of opinions. It might mean if uh, in the in, in the ABC in Australia, frankly, it seems to me you'll have people with different cultural backgrounds, but not of viewpoint diversity at all. Uh, inclusion only applies if you accept the group think, uh, and equality tends out to, uh, turns out to be all about quotas and a drift towards totalitarian. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, you will be equal rather than a quality of opportunity. The outcomes, if you like, the fruit of all of this, we've been at it for quite a while now, it just becomes more and more and more distressing, more and more obvious that uh, it's not working. And there's an old saying in this country that, you know, sometimes you want to need to quit, stop digging while you're behind, you know, uh, give up. But it's as though there's a lack of humility as well as honesty on the part of those who are, if you like, in a position to try and open up things for debate, to be honest, to try and say, let's have a fair income look, sorry, another Australianism, a real look at what's happening. They're just not prepared to do it. And perhaps the smugness of tenure is part of the problem. I think perhaps perhaps it's it's partly to do with tenure. I think also many of these ideas have morphed into a, a new religion for uh, the ruling class, as John McWhorter and others have pointed out. There is a religious quality to this ideological worldview of of radical progressivism that, for its true believers, it really does give them a sense of meaning and purpose, even if it's not empirically valid. And you can see that, for example, in the extent to which organisations embrace things like anti-racism training or teaching in white privilege you know many of the the measures that have been used in those training uh, sessions have been shown to be em empirically flawed um, and have been shown to be to be worthless but but yet we continue to spend millions if not billions in pushing a lot of this stuff I mean there is if you read the the literature on diversity training in the social sciences is pretty clear in in, in saying it, it either has no effect at all, uh, or it can make people even more prejudiced towards other groups. Uh, there was a recent comprehensive review in in the annual uh, review of psychology, a prominent prestigious journal, which basically concluded by saying it wasn't sure that the amount of money we're spending on all of this stuff was justifiable because of the lack of effect it was having. Um, but yet we don't seem to be able to talk talk about any of that. And I noticed this most most visibly in Britain when when we had a report that was uh, published, a government report on on uh, inequalities and, and social mobility in Britain, which concluded that the main cause of disparities between different groups was not institutional racism, uh, but was to do with things like entrenched economic deprivation, family breakdown, um, differences in cultural values. Uh, and that report, that, led by a man called Tony Sewell, um, uh, who was himself uh, uh, black uh, was was widely criticised and dismissed by the ruling class as being um, uh, you know, illegitimate, unacceptable because he had challenged the central claim among the new elite, which is that 
all Western societies are institutionally racist and all disparities among groups are therefore based around prejudice and discrimination. When in fact, the reality, as I think we know quite clearly from the evidence is it's a lot more complicated than that. It's, it's a multivariate explanation and that things like the very high rates of family breakdown, particularly in the black British Caribbean community where 63% of children are in single parent uh, households. Um, you know, those things really matter, but we, we, we can't seem to have a mature conversation about, about the role of those factors in, in these inequalities. So what we're left with is a stifling, boring, unproductive, um, very um, narrow orthodoxy that reflects the view of this new elite, but doesn't take us very far in actually dealing with society's problems. G.K. Chesterton made the observation that when we stop believing in God, it's not that we believe in nothing, it's that we come to believe in almost anything. And that seems to be the pattern today. Uh, you know, you've got as many belief systems almost as there are citizens with a lack of sort of glue to hold them together. So given that people always thought that, uh, particularly in Britain, the middle classes were the strength of the nation, it seems to me there's a lot of individual uncertainty and loneliness, anxiety, if you like, uh, that must feed into the, that sense of dissatisfaction, that, that lack of direction, do you think? Well, I think all the, the, the big narratives that we once had to hold the nation together have essentially broken down. I mean, re religion uh, has broken down. Only 1% of Generation Z uh, who are in my university classes who were born after 1996, only 1% identify with the Church of England. Uh, social class has... has increasingly broken down and become much more blurred uh as as a as a framework in society um national identity is broken down for all the reasons that we've discussed it's broken down because we have a ruling class that is reshaping that around international themes uh and it's broken down because the institutions now put much less of an emphasis upon that and so where we are as we are simultaneously bombarded by ongoing globalization, mass migration, um, what, we're, what we're left with is, is a lack of social trust, um, a lack of glue that holds communities and, and societies together, a sense of constant churn, constant change, um, that nobody's really settled uh, or has an anchor. Uh, and if you look at the nation as, as a home, um, you know, and, and, and you view it through that lens, um, then, then your home is increasingly feeling like chaos and is increasingly fragile and unpredictable and volatile. Uh, nobody wants to live in a home like that. People want stability, security, peace. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's something I hear time and time again in, in focus groups with voters, the sense of bewilderment, the sense that everything is moving so fast uh, and that nobody seems to be in control of these big issues, or if anything, uh, they're invested in keeping the pedal down uh, as 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 hard as possible. Um, so it's it, it comes back to that notion of control, and it comes back to the the very real policy decisions that that have been taken. I mean, and and the policy decisions that have been taken over the last seven years, eight years, I would argue are are pretty disastrous in terms of trying to give people a sense of security and belonging. Tell me, you do a lot of focus group work, you say. Uh, you might be able to throw some light on something that's a mystery to me. Um, we have seen this extraordinary explosion of critical theory out of academia. How it ever grew in academia, I don't know, because it doesn't stand in any scrutiny. But out into the streets, into the entertainment industry, into politics everywhere, um, a critical race theory, critical gender theory, critical queer theory, critical fact theory. I mean, it, it's extraordinary, really. But the nub of my question is, we now believe that we're deeply racist, apparently. We believe the critical theory idea that the world's problem is white supremacy. How do people sitting in a focus group reconcile themselves to their belief that they're not racist. I don't think many people think they're racist, at least they wouldn't own it, with the idea that that's now our essential problem and that's why the world's in such a mess because that's what critical theory is telling us. 
Well, um, they're very skeptical, um, but they also don't want to be seen as a as a as a bad person. Um, the power of social norms is incredibly strong. Uh, what's happened over the last 20, 30 years is that the, the the new elite, in my mind at least, have steadily expanded concepts. They've stretched concepts like racism and discrimination to essentially encompass things that that are that are not racist or discriminatory at all, um, but which challenge the political consensus. So if you look at how we talk about this sort of amorphous notion of hate uh, or hate crimes, um, you know, they they often encompass things like questioning mass immigration. Uh, we even had police investigating things called nonviolent hate crimes, where um, essentially in um, the person who perceived that they had been insulted in some way, that that was sufficient uh, to warrant uh, police intervention uh, in uh, holding somebody up for for a hate crime, which would then go on their record. So, you know, we've seen the expansion of these concepts. Uh, when it comes to things like you know, white privilege, for example, we've got studies in the social sciences which have found that when you teach people about white privilege, which is itself a deeply flawed concept, they become less sympathetic to working class whites. So they it, it, it's actually a very divisive um, concept, um, not only because of, of, of the notion, but, but because of how it is wiring people to look down on other members of their national community um, in, in a very uh, divisive way. And, and, and this is, you know, we see this now increasingly in, in British schools where we've had a number of stu studies recently that have shown um, children being exposed to um, critical race theory, gender identity theory, um, being separated in after school clubs on the basis of their race, um, black children being given extra classes on Sundays that are not given to their white counterparts. Um, you know, and when people say to me on Twitter or social media, you know, these things aren't happening, um, you know, they really are. Uh, and freedom of information requests have shown this uh, to be the case. And I think for the average voter who sits in my focus group, you know, on the one hand, they're desperate not to be seen to violate any of these social norms. They don't want to be seen as as as, as racist, as, uh, as as discriminatory, as a bad person. They want to be seen as a good person is trying to make the world a better place um but they're also slowly realizing that um many of the ideas that are being imposed upon them uh come with an alternative agenda uh and that that realization is is slowly creeping creeping in that uh i think people can sense that there is no unifying narrative here anymore if the only interesting thing about our children is what fixed group they belong to and their race, not their character, you know, people will uh, and are increasingly uncomfortable about that. Parents protesting outside of school gates, questioning why their children are being taught there are 72 genders. Um, that will all accelerate in the years ahead um, because it is so blatantly dismissive of science and it is so detached from evidence um, that I just cannot see parents going going along with that over the longer term. And I can't see voters going along with it over the longer term. And if you look at British politics over the last few years, we have seen a number of big pushbacks. You know, when Scotland tried to allow 16-year-olds to legally change their gender without any consultation with their with medical professionals or, or parents, 80% uh, of voters said, this is a bad idea. And the Scottish National Party were not able to push it through. Uh, the Labour Party has just retreated on gender self-ID. Uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has come out and said, you know, he he now accepts that his earlier definition of, of you know, what is a woman, uh, you know, was inaccurate. Um, we're beginning to see slowly, I think, some sense of uh, uh, you know, normality or common sense descending on the political class but but it's it's taking time um it, it is taking time you um i think have had a little to say about black lives matters recently I mean, many many middle class people uh, lined up with an organization that was avowedly marxist uh until uh, 
it became well known. Uh, it had on its website that it was committed to the destruction of the nuclear family. That uh, it was a pretty interesting group. Now they capitalised on an awful event to justify some pretty extreme activities, and a lot of people were too afraid to say this is not a good idea. You know, you had to appear to be supporting Black Lives Matters, and the defunding of police in the United States appears to have gone very badly. I think you've said a bit about this recently, that you know, that we can look back on it. It should feed into that narrative that people are a bit suspicious of some of the uh, the movements that they're being talked into uh, or, or that people are trying to persuade them to back. Yeah, we just had an interesting study in the social sciences, which has found that um, it looked at, at, at areas that had uh, experienced BLM protests. And it found that uh, essentially there was a sort of mass withdrawal of policing in the aftermath of those protests. And uh, on the one hand, as you'd imagine, that led to a fall in in uh, in in murders and and deaths at the hands of police. Um, there was much less police activity. But what it also did is it it led to a very sharp increase in crime. So the murder rate increased by eleven percent, which resulted in about three thousand additional deaths that would not have happened had routine normal policing being maintained uh much can you, fewer can you just repeat arrests. that for the emphasis can you just repeat that so you've had yeah, how so many in the americans yeah in the aftermath of of the blm protests there was an 11 percent increase in in the murder rate which was equivalent to three thousand lives lost so essentially the same number as 9 11. um and uh and you know this is I find that a very trauma, you know, troubling fact that we should be debating and discussing. Um, there was also, by the way, in that study, uh, it points out, John, in the aftermath of the BLM protests, voluntary redundancies among police officers increased by nearly 300%. Uh, so you saw a kind of collapse of morale among police who clearly felt that the the narrative around BLM was, was, was not was not an accurate one, um, but who also then decided that certain crimes and, and and things you know simply would not be attended to in the same way that they would normally. So arrests at property, uh, property crime plummeted, um, arrests at other uh, crime scenes plummeted, and, and murders soared. Um, you know, so we all had this curious moment where we were watching the protests during COVID. You know, on, on the one hand, being told to stay at home; on the other hand, being told that protests were acceptable. Um, but we can now see what the real world impact of of that really was, which is why African Americans and Latino Hispanic voters have consistently been the most strongly opposed to ideas like defund the police because they are the first people to experience elevated crime, and it's another example of a luxury belief. You know, this idea that. Uh, that, 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 that Rob Henderson at Cambridge has talked about, that, that the elite will often push luxury beliefs that bring no cost to them, which bring them status from other elites, but which impose very high costs on other people. Defunding the police is a classic example of that. Uh, and only a couple of weeks ago, one of the leading advocates of that idea was, was herself attacked in the street. And she promptly hit social media to say, you know, where were the police? Where was the you know, law, law and order, um, and, it, and it became a symbol online of, of this this deep hypocrisy that runs through the new elite. But you could also point at the things we've discussed, you know, the, the constant push for mass immigration. It's not going to be the new elite who deal with the consequences of that. The constant push for more more deregulation, more globalization, uh, more more prioritizing the interests of big business. It's not going to be the new elite who will who will suffer the consequences of that. It's going to be the working class. It's going to be non-graduates in the towns outside of the cities. Um, the, the constant push for gender identity, uh, the constant push for denigrating the nation. It's not going to be the new elite who, who worry about that. They don't get their sense of status and belonging from the nation. They get it from their achieved identities, from their, their education, from their professional success. It's going to be the working class plumber and electrician who really does care about the nation, who sees that his membership or her membership of the nation as a really important part of who they are. Um, and so, you know, from you can go through the policy areas and as this ruling class drifts further and further away, they are increasingly pushing ideas that 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 I think uh, that I think are disastrous for everybody else. 
uh, but which they won't ever really feel the consequence of. Well, circumstances like this, I think probably you and I would agree that what we need is a new class, if I can put it that way, of heroes, real heroes, you know, to rise up and, 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 and sort of say, let's put our foundations down again. We're not going to put up with this nonsense anymore. But that requires engagement. It requires people to feel confident enough to risk cancel culture. It requires them to be passionately committed to their neighbours, uh, their, their community, their country. How do we encourage those people to come forward, in your view, to, to land this plane, if I can put it that way? Yeah, I've been thinking quite a lot about this. I've also written about, about the need for a new political movement here in Britain. And one of the things that struck me guiding through uh, a piece of legislation in Parliament around defending free speech in the, in the universities was how few people that actually took. There were really only about two dozen of us who who designed that law, who, who lobbied for it, campaigned for it, helped politicians get it through. And it reminded me that, you know, often you don't need you don't need a mass movement to change the dial. Uh, often you you need, you know, an SAS, a, a, a small, highly committed um, battalion of people who are willing to put their heads above the parapet, and provide a model to other people. And that's what I would argue radical progressives have done very effectively, is they have been a very committed, disciplined activist minority who moderate liberals have been very scared of, of taking on. So, the, you know, the moderates tend to stay quiet, bearing the consequence of what might happen if they speak out. And I think conservatives have really not done a great job of learning the lessons of that, which is we need a new counter elite. You know, we need to build a new counter elite that is present in the institutions, that is intellectually anchored, uh, that has a strong sense of history uh, and philosophy, uh, and um, is action oriented, uh, knows how to get things done. Uh, and I think you can see those people emerging on the international stage. You can see, for example, in America, how one or two activists have completely changed the debate yes. on education, have completely changed the debate on, on, on opposing CRT. But I think you can see that also in other areas, you know, Brexit, you know, the way in which you know, one person in the form of, of Nigel Farage essentially changed that political debate during the, the 2000s. Um, you can see it in parts of Europe too. So I think really it is about the question is how can you promote a counter elite and keep them organized? And also, by the way, John, keep them funded. I mean, I'm often approached by philanthropists and donors who say, look, you know, I'm creating this new network. I'm, I'm building this new movement. And I always say to them, you know, there are people out there already doing lots of important work, um, but they need funding, they need support, they need financial insulation. I remember Jordan Peterson making this point at, at an event in London and saying that you can't even begin to take on the culture unless you're financially insulated, you know, because the first thing they'll go for is your livelihood. The first thing they'll go for is your career and your profession. So giving people a sense of, of financial insulation and security and giving them a sense of, of unity and organization and accepting that we might not need a mass movement, but we, we might need a vanguard. Uh, and finding that and promoting it, I think, is, is, is really important. Matthew, you've been very generous with your time. You've given us a great deal to, thank, to think about. And I want to say thank you very much. Thanks for having me, John. And, um, Thanks for everybody who's tuned in.